All right. So thank you very much for uh, those of you who fill out the survey. Um, so according to the survey, I find like most people are confused about like the conceptual behind heat capacity, Joe Thompson experiment, and enthalpy. So that's the first part we're gonna go over by this like long list of trend force questions, and then lots of people uh, voted for the second law of thermodynamics and also Carnot cycle. So to emphasize on that topic, I posted like a new kind of heat engine. It's not Carnot cycle, but it is also a thermodynamic circle. I will use that as an example to see like how to use something we learned in a different thermodynamic circle that you've never seen before, say to calculate efficiency of a different heat engine. And at the end, it seems like conceptually, we also want to emphasize um, the like what's what exactly is behind all those terminologies regarding to entropy like what does it mean by like say entropy is a extensive state function so we're going to do more true and false problems so i like to do these true and false problems in the textbook with you not only because they're like very good practice and also like these true and false questions can be easily translated into like a short answer problem so even if they appear to be true and false we might ask it in a different kind of format but they are very educational so let's just go over it um together and see like what is the logic behind each question like when, when we say this false why it is false and how can we make it correct all right so let's do this together um this is a little bit too compact so i hope you can uh, it, uh, like let me know if you feel like it's too small and you can't see it but i'm gonna read it with you and see what are we thinking while reading the problem first one it says delta h is a state function so when reading this problem the first thing you want to ask yourself is what is a state function right so a thermodynamic state function basically tells us a um, it tells us about a specific thermodynamic state so in chapter one we went over a discussion in what is a thermodynamic state so a thermodynamic state in a certain equilibrium has particular values for each thermodynamic properties. So these thermodynamic properties are thus called state functions. Right? So these thermodynamic properties defining a thermodynamic state, we have several examples. We have volume, we have temperature, we have pressure, we also have enthalpy or entropy or internal energy. So in this case, H or enthalpy itself is a state function. However, when we say delta H, delta H is defined by H final minus H initial. Right? So it's talking about the difference between two thermodynamic states. And thus, delta H is not a state function. All right, so this one is false. I'm going to um, just go over it and then erase the note I just write. But you will see a, a list of like annotation in my updated lecture notes. Next one, CV. So CV, that's our volume heat capacity, is independent of temperature for every perfect gas. So what do we think about this one? So this one is false whenever we say like um, an ideal gas. So something is true, for example, for ideal gases or perfect gases. Uh, when we say, when we see perfect gas, effectively what we have is saying we have CV equals to dQV over T. So this QV means it's a heat transfer at constant volume. And that equals to, sorry, dt. And in this, for ideal gases, this equals to du over dt. So that's something we can tell. But it's not necessarily saying um, the CV must be a constant.
Okay, next one. Delta U equals to Q plus W for every thermodynamic system at rest in absence of external field. So I'll tell you this one is false, but someone tell me why it is false. So delta U equals to Q plus W, that's part of our first law of thermodynamics. It tells us the system is at rest, so no kinetic energy, absence of external field, uh, no potential energy. So, so far, so good. But we're missing one more criteria for this. Yes? Does it have to be a closed system? Yes, it must be a closed system. If it's not a closed system, we have exchange of matters, and thus your delta U is no longer only equal to Q plus W. All right, so this is one example. Just read it carefully and compare it with what we know when we first derive this equation together or first um, seeing this equation together. Next up, a process in which the final temperature equals the initial temperature must be an isothermal process. That's, all. That's first. So this one is also false. So for an isothermal process, it only tells us the final temperature and the initial temperature is the same. So this question tells us our delta T is zero. But for the isothermal process, what we're saying is temperature is kept constant. And also my dT should also equal to zero. And hence, this is false. Um, next up, let's see. For a closed system, now we have closed, at rest in absence of external field, U equals to Q plus W. Is this one true or false? So this one is also false. For what reason? Yes. Right, so Q and W describes processes. So this must be a delta U. All right, so the change of internal energy for the closed system at rest, no external field equals to Q plus W. Um, next up, internal energy will remain constant in every isothermal processes in a closed system. The concept we're using is, is almost the same concept, but using it in a different way. So what about this one? So internal energy remains constant for every isothermal processes. Right, so this one is false. Um, and the best way to approach this kind of question is thinking about what exactly is my internal energy depends on. So for anything that's not ideal gas, my internal energy is a function of temperature and volume. But for ideal gases, my um, internal energy is a function of con temperature. So in this case, because we, do not, because we don't know how volume is changing, we don't know how internal energy is changing, and because we didn't specify ideal gases. So how to make this one um, true? We have two different ways to make it true, right? So first way is to say this is an isothermal and also isochoric process. So we keep both my temperature and volume at constant. So my internal energy is fixed. Or we specify this is for ideal gas only. OK, next up. Am I going too fast or it's OK? OK. Um, so Q equals to zero for every cyclic process. So raise your hand if you think it's false. Okay, so this one is pretty straightforward, right? So Q is a line integral. So the line integrals doesn't vanish for cyclic processes. And this one, delta U equals to zero for every cyclic processes. This sounds fine. 
it is fine, <laughs> right? So delta U does vanish for every cyclic processes because internal energy is a state function, right? So it doesn't. It only cares for the initial and final state. But do be careful. It is. It is good to be cautious when you see something like every process. Just ask yourself, like for every cyclic process, the only thing that vanish is the change of a state function. Basically, this question is asking us, is internal energy a state function? And the answer is yes. All right, next up. Delta T equals to zero for every adiabatic process in a closed system. So this is one is not true, right? So you, um, and when we're writing at it, the easier way to say like, oh, I say delta T equals to zero. So no change in temperature for every adiabatic process. I write Q equals to zero. And they don't necessarily link to each other, right? So Q equals to zero doesn't tell me delta T equals to zero. We see that re repeatedly in when well, we're deriving, say, adiabatic expansion for ideal gases. All right. Next up, we have a thermodynamic process is specified by specifying the initial state and final state of the system. So this one is false, right? So when we're talking about a thermodynamic process, remember, we want a way to, say, calculate my Q and W of that process. So these line integrals require us to specify the exact path that the thermodynamic process is taking place, whether it's adiabatic followed by isothermal or isobaric followed by um, isochoric, right? So these are processes we need to specify, not only the initial and final state. Um, next up, if a closed system at rest in absence of external field undergoes an adiabatic process that has W equals to zero, then the system's temperature must remain constant. So raise your hand if you think this is true. Okay, if you think it's false. You want to explain why you think it is false? You can, you can expand against a, uh, into a vacuum, and that satisfies what you need to know. And it's also in your bag. That's a Joe experiment, yes. So our initial and final temperature is the same, but the temperature can change in the process. So in this case, the, the biggest thing here is even if, the, in addition to what you were saying, what we we're saying is a closed system at rest um, undergoes an adiabatic process. So this one we have Q equals to zero, work equals to zero. What we have is delta U equals to zero, right? So we do have the change of internal energy equals to zero. But if it is not an ideal gas, we cannot conclude that delta T is zero. So in order to make this statement true, we can add a criteria to say, like, if this is ideal gas, then we can make the conclusion that delta T is zero. But still, the, the temperature is not constant along the way. Right? It can change along the way. But initial and final temperature will be the same. So a true statement for this one is, if a closed system at rest in absence of external field undergoes an adiabatic process that has W equals to zero, then the initial and final temperature of the system will be the same for ideal gases. That's how to make this statement a true statement. So this is one of the practice you can try. Like when, when you see a statement that's false, think about like what I should do to make this one a true statement. That's very educational along the way. All right, next up, we have <coughs> PV work is usually uh, negligible for solid and liquids. So this one is true, um, but I don't, I don't really like the, the statement because it's a little bit ambiguous. But the, the, the bottom line here is thinking about PV work, right? So your system is either expanding or contracting. Now, gas is pretty easy to be um, expanded or contracted, apply pressure on there. But say if I have a solid, um, just like this piece of chalk, I apply pressure to it. The volume will change, but that change of volume is going to be very, very small. 
So that's what this question is saying. The PV work is usually um, negligible for solid and liquid. So even if, imagine you're applying pressure to a piece of solid, it's really hard to contract that solid or liquid. Okay, next up. If neither heat nor matter can enter or leave a system, uh, that system must be isolated. So this one is also another tricky question. It didn't specify the system is at rest with no external field. So it can still interact with the surrounding in some way. And yeah, I don't, I don't really like this one, but this one is false. Next one. For a closed system with PV work only, a constant pressure process that has Q larger than zero must have um, delta T larger than zero. So in this one, what are we saying? We have a closed system with PV work only. For a constant pressure process, what do we have? So in this case, even if it's specified the constant pressure process, we don't know how volume is changing, and thus we do not know how my work is going to change. So even if we know that Q is larger than zero, we can't make any direct link between that Q larger than zero to delta T larger than zero. Well, and in addition, we don't know whether it's an ideal gas or not, so my internal energy is less connected to temperature change. So this one is false for multiple reasons. Um, next up, let's see. This one is more like a math problem. So I'll quickly write out this math together. So the integral of one over V dV, so we solve it to be between one to two, ln v2 minus ln v1, which equals to ln v2 over v1. So that's a math problem, and it's false because your ln v2 minus ln v1 doesn't equal to ln v2 minus v1. Okay. Next up, <clears throat> the value of delta u is independent of the path or process used to go from state one to state two. So this one should be true, right? So again, we're talking about internal energy being a state function independent of the path it is taking. Okay, next one. For any processes, um, the delta big T is equal to delta small t, well, the big T and small t are Kelvin and Celsius temperatures. So this one is true because my Celsius temperature is just Kelvin plus 273 um, degrees. But this will be false if we now say the small t is a favorite height. So that's just a difference. Next one. If q equals to 0 for a process, then the process must be isothermal. So again, this is definitely not true. Q equals to zero only tells us the process is adiabatic, doesn't allow heat exchange. But heat, Q equals to zero doesn't mean my system cannot do work on the surrounding or work uh, surrounding cannot do work on my system. Right? So this is false. But we can make it correct by saying the process must be adiabatic. Next up. Um, for a reversible process, P must be constant. So this one is just irrelevant, right? So reversibility doesn't necessarily require P to be a constant. Next up, um, again, a mass problem. So we, we did this derivation before. So what we want is this ends up to be ln T2 minus ln T1, not ln T2 over ln T1. So this one is also false. Um, next up, if the final temperature equals the initial temperature, the process must be an isothermal process. We did that before. This only tells us 
if the final temperature, the initial temperature only tells us delta T equals to zero. But for isothermal process, the temperature is constant. So even like DT need to be equal to zero. And at the end, we have again a math problem. So for these kind of math problem, it's, it doesn't hurt to just solve that integral. Um, and then you'll see whether or not it is true, right? So this one is the same. You solve this integral between 1 to 2 dt that equals to 1 half t squared between t1 to t2. And that is 1 half um, t2 squared minus t1 squared. And that's definitely not the same as t2 minus t1 parenthesis squared. So this one is this. All right. How do you feel about this true and false marathon? It's very long, but we spend like about one minute for each question. And um, it, it shouldn't take you too much of the time, but do give it careful thought when reading the problem. So that's the most important take home message. And any questions on this part? Yes. Which one? Uh, for v. v. U. U. So isothermal tells us my temperature is constant along the entire process. All right, so in the, even like infinitesimal changes of temperature should equal to zero. But what this question is telling us is the final temperature equals to initial temperature. So it's telling us delta T equals to zero. Um, if we put it on a plot, let's say we're plotting temperature with respect to entropy, right? So what this question tells us is say we start, say, from initial point to the final point. So as long as my initial and final point are the same, in the process, my temperature can change. So that's what the question is stating. This is, say, like delta T equals to zero. But for an isothermal process, we're saying the temperature is constant, right? So this line tells us we have isothermal process. Or dt also equals to zero. Or logically speaking, every isothermal processes must have delta t equals to zero. But delta t equals to zero doesn't tell us the process is isothermal. All right. OK, next up. And let's look at some. Well, I call it fine um, example, but I'll see. A different kind of cycle. So I guess I call it beyond kernel cycle. So what we want to say is assuming the system is at rest, no field. Let's see, I give you a setup for a different kind of cycle. So this one is called Brayton cycle or Joule cycle. So that actually reflects how the heat engine works in like a airplane. Right, so let's look at how the setup is. In here, let's say we have a combustor, and then you will have fuel burning in that combustor. On the left-hand side, we have a compressor. On the right-hand side, we have something called turbine. So both, of, um, both compressor and my turbine are closed chamber. So you have gas in there, but they're closed. So gas in there doesn't, ex um, doesn't like exit. But they are uh, surrounded by like soft wall that can move, so the volume of this chamber can change in the process. And looking at here, what do we have? Imagine we have the cyclic process, and we're going to go over it one by one. The first step is an adiabatic compression of the, this part, the compressor. All right, so we are imagining a um, adiabatic process, and this compressor is um, um, and the volume of the compressor is like decreasing. So that's from my A to B. And for this cycle, let's assume it has undergo a reversible process. So from A to B, what we have is adiabatic. So Q equals to zero my volume is decreasing. And then after the compression, 
imagine we have B to C, step B to step C. So that's an isobaric heat input. What exactly does it mean? It means like we're burning fuel inside the combustor to add heat. So I call this Q2. at B to C. All right, so the heat is input by burning of the fuel. So how exactly does the reaction happening when burning the fuel, we don't care. So our system is my gas inside my compressor and turbine. Whatever those gas get is the heat input by burning of the fuel, which is Q2. Now, after burning of the fuel, obviously the heat transfer into the gas of my turbine, and then that heat transfer inside will then undergo a adiabatic expansion after the heat goes in. So my second, uh, my third step is adiabatic expansion, and during the process of expansion, my turbine will do work on the surrounding. So in here, we will have part of the work put my compressor back into its original state. We call it W compressing. And then part of the work exiting the nozzle to do work on the surrounding, or we call it work output. And in the last step between D to A, let's say we have some kind of work um, heat going out. So we're cooling the entire system back to its original state. So if you're thinking about the process, right? So that's how the compressor um, is adiabatically uh, compressed first. And then we input heat. After we input the heat, the um, gas in the turbine is doing work on the surrounding and output work from this circle and at the end we want to cool the entire system down back to its original state that finish a cycle now that's the setup the question here is what is the efficiency of this cycle express the efficiency of the cycle using the temperature at your t um well basically using the temperature and your ta Tb, Tc, and Td. All right. So this is a kind of question. It looks very complicated, but the kind of knowledge we use is already pre-established. So we'll work on this together as an example. So by the way, this will, if this appears on your exam, it's going to be something like a comprehensive problem, like the larger problem with multiple parts. Let's see the first part. What do we know about this process? Now, when we're thinking about calculating the um, efficiency, that's what the question is asking. The first thing you want to do is write out an expression for efficiency. So in our original definition of efficiency, we got work output over heat input. Or if you put it on our diagram, we're looking at the work output coming out from the nozzle. This one, the work compression, is going from my turbine to my compressor. Since my system is considering both the compressor and the turbine, this part of the work shouldn't be considered in the process. We're only focusing on the work output by my system to the surrounding. So work output over heat input. And in here, our heat input is Q2 or Q1. Q2, right. So this is the expression we will come by using by saying like, OK, so we're talking about calculating efficiency of this cycle, and that's the equation we want to use to calculate efficiency. Now, what else do we know? 
We want to have Q2 as work output. We want to have a way to link these terms with our temperature change. So a few things. Let's go this way. When we're looking at Q2, so that is a isobaric heat transfer. All right. So an isobaric heat transfer, we have QP, so it's a heat at constant pressure, well, equal to my delta H of the process. And for Q2, we have temperature between my Tb and Tc. So since we're talking about an ideal cycle, assuming it is ideal gas, I should probably give you that. And constant Cp, we can rewrite this one to be my um, Cp times delta T, which is the temperature between my C to B. Right, so C is my final temperature, and B is my initial temperature. All right. Thirdly, how do we find out an expression for the total work output? So, what do we know? We know the heat transfer for all four steps. Right, so two of them are isobaric heat transfer. We can calculate it by delta T and also using the heat capacity Cp. Two of them are adiabatic. So total Q equals to zero for those two adiabatic processes. So if we take consideration of the entire cyclic process, what we have is the delta U cyclic will equal to your total work plus your total heat. So when I say the total work and the total heat, I'm referring to how much heat has been transferred into the system versus how much work is output from the system. Right? So my internal energy of the entire circle is conserved. So in this process, the total work output will equal to my total heat input, because their signs are different. With me so far? So in this case, what we end up getting is this Q total is my Q2 plus Q1. And if I want my work output as a positive number, and we'll have the work So the work compression is talking about my um, work, my uh, gas in the turbine doing work in, for the gas in the compressor. Now my system consists both the compressor and the turbine. So that is the internal work that's, that's being considered. So in this case, we're talking about the entire cycle. Now we did finish my entire cycle. The total internal energy of my system is conserved. Right, so the total um, heat input minus the total work output must equal to zero because my delta U for the cyclic process is zero. Yes? So in this case, remember, we're talking about how much work is input into the system. Even if Q1 is negative, we'll see it being negative. We still want to write both of them as a positive number in this case. Because here we're referring to the heat input into the system. And now we have an expression for my work output. That equals to Q1 plus Q2. And using the same example here, for isobaric heat transfer, my, uh, we have a mean to calculate Q1 and Q2. And that equals to, first of 
for Q1, we already calculated Q2. So for Q1, um, or we're talking about the Q between D to A. That is CP times TA minus TD. Right. And in here, like what you were saying, we can do a quick sanity check. So the temperature of my TA must be smaller than my temperature at D. So my TA and TD will be a negative number, and hence it's saying the heat is output from the system. So, and that's a nice sanity check we can do. So in here, what we end up having is work output equals to CP times, well, Q1 and Q2, so TA minus TD plus TC minus TB. So that's our work output. And we have our heat input. We're ready to calculate the efficiency to be W over Q2. Well, that's this entire thing. CP, TA minus TD plus TC minus TB and divided by my Q2. CP times TC minus TB. So my heat capacity cancels out. The efficiency only depends on the temperatures of my different steps. So in this case, we're talking about, um, it is plus if we're talking about how much work is being done on the system, right? But now the work output is, we're trying to say this one is the work that's being done by the system to the surrounding, and that's where that negative comes from. All right, how do you feel about this problem? It looks very complicated at the beginning when I work you through. But effectively, when you're thinking about the process and how to solve the process, look at what the question is asking for. It's asking for efficiency. So we write out an expression for efficiency. And thinking about, like in here, Q2 is given, but we want to express our answer in temperature. So how to link my Q2 with temperature? And we read the question, we say, okay, Ideal gases, constant pressure, that equals to delta H. Right, so we use our heat capacity uh, times the change of temperature for ideal gases. And eventually, we can leave the heat capacity here and be like, I don't know what the heat capacity is. But you'll find out the heat capacity will cancel out at the very end. So we'll leave it there. So that tells us in the problem where you feel like, oh, I don't have enough information. Just leave it there. And maybe later on, they will cancel out. And then... With this intent, we then want to say, how do we find out the total work that's been done? For that, we use our first law of thermodynamics and find out, okay, so we're just looking at the total work and the total heat. And we solve for an expression for the total work, and then we have our efficiency. And obviously from here, we can have follow-up numeric questions, like say, um, well, we give you the temperatures of these reservoirs and tell us what is the efficiency of that cycle. So that's but what, what I mean by this one can easily be a comprehensive multi-part problem. All right, any questions? No? Okay. And then for entropy, we have more trend force to come. So back to trend force marathon. This part, let's just, again, read the questions together and see what you think. First one, a change of state from state one to state two produces a greater increase in entropy when carried out irreversibly than when done reversibly. So raise your hand if you think it's true. Raise your hand if you think it's false. And why do you think that's false? Right, so this one gives us, 
the change of state between state one and state two. So we specified our initial and final state. For entropy as a state function, the change of entropy between two specified thermodynamic states will be the same. And that is why we can build reversible paths to solve for entropy for irreversible processes. All right. Next up, the heat Q for an irreversible change from state, um, change of state from state one to two might differ from the heat for the same change of state carried out reversibly. So this one is true. Now we're talking about the heat, right? So Q reversible and Q irreversible. And since our heat is a line integral, it's dependent on path, right? So the, depending on the path, my heat will be different. Next up. The higher the absolute temperature of a system, the smaller the increase in its entropy produced by a given positive amount dQ of reversible heat flow. This one reads very long, but it becomes very obvious if we write out our expression for entropy. So my dS equals to dQ reversible over temperature. So the higher the temperature, given that dQ reversible is the same, the smaller the dS. So this one is also true. Okay. The next two questions are connected with each other. The first one, the entropy of 20... Um, the entropy of 20 grams of H2O liquid at 300 Kelvin one bar is twice the entropy of 10 gram of water at 300 Kelvin and one bar. So in here, the point we're using is that entropy is an extensive state function, right? So this 300 Kelvin and one bar specified its thermodynamic states are the same for these two liquid um, water. And the only thing difference is the number of moles, right? So double the number of moles will double the entropy because entropy is an extensive state function. Next up, the molar entropy of 20 gram of liquid water at 300 Kelvin in one bar is equal to the molar entropy of 10 gram of uh, liquid water at 300 Kelvin and one bar. So this one is also true since our molar entropy, um, as with a small subscri sub subscription M, equals to S divided by number of moles. So my molar entropy is an intensive state function. All right, so it is one thing to know that entropy is a extensive state function, it is the other way to, uh, it is a, an, another challenge to read the question and recognize, oh, so this question is asking me whether or not entropy is an extensive or intensive state function. Next up, for a reversible isothermal process in a closed system, delta S must be zero. So a reversible isothermal process, right? So my delta S equals to the integral of my Q reversible over T. An isothermal basically tells us we can take that T out and this becomes Q reversible over T. And now my question is, is my Q reversible always equal to zero for isothermal processes? And the answer is not necessarily. Right, so my Q-reversible only equals to zero when we say it's adiabatic. Again, the reason Q-reversible is not zero for isothermal processes is, is you might have system doing work on the surrounding or surrounding doing work on the system, even for ideal gases. 
for non-ideal gases, we don't even know how internal energy is going to change with respect to volume. Next up, the integral of um, T minus 1 CV dt is always equal to CV ln T2 over T1. So this is not true because we don't know if CV is a constant. Um, next up, the system's entropy change for an adiabatic process in a closed system must be zero. Again, the system's entropy change, so we read it as delta S. For an adiabatic process, we write Q equals to zero. But we didn't specify this being a reversible adiabatic process. So like the Joule experiment we were discussing, Q irreversible equal to zero doesn't tell us entropy equal to zero. So for questions related to entropy, just keep your mind, like write out this expression, ds equals to dq reversible equals to t. Like, do we really know what q reversible is? Next up, thermodynamics cannot calculate delta s for an irreversible processes. And we did that in class several times, right? So for irreversible processes, we need to build a reversible path linking your initial and final state. And then we can use thermodynamics to calculate entropy change. Next up, for a reversible process in a closed system, dq is equal to tds. So now we specified the process being reversible, and then we're happy, right? So in, in this original definition, TDS equals to DQ reversible. As long as we specify the process being a reversible process, the statement is true. Last one. The formula of 3.4, which remember that's the um, example problems we did together for different processes um, to calculate delta S, enable us to calculate delta S for various processes, but do not enable us to find the value of S of a thermodynamic state. And this one is true, right? So for my entire 3.4, we spend a lot of time talking about what is delta S, and that equals to the integral of the Q reversible over T. We went over several different examples to see how do we set up this integral, or how do we set up my question so we have a reversible path that we can solve this integral for. But we're only talking about the relative change between an initial state and a final state. We haven't given delta S or absolute zero um, entropy as a definition. Right? So we don't know at which point my entropy is zero. So we'll do that when we talk about the third law of thermodynamics. So this statement is true. So I hope this is a nice overview on things that you feel a little bit confused. Again, by doing these true and false problems, um, it's one thing to get the answer correct and do give them a little bit more thought, thinking like, how can I make this, if it is true, how can I make it false? Or if it is false, how can I change the statement to make it true? So that can easily be translated into a short answer problem. Right? And this represents a nice comprehensive problem in like on top of Carnot cycle, that in Carnot cycle, we learn how to analyze a heat engine. We learn how to calculate different um, heat work or um, delta U of the process and of the entire cycle and also how to calculate efficiency. Now, we translate what we know from Carnot cycle into a different thermodynamic cycle. Can we still do the same looking at the problem? All right, and that's all from me. Your TA will be with you tomorrow for the final tutorial or review session, etc. Um, but good luck, and I'll see you on Friday.